Okay, uh, we'll get started with today's discussion. In the previous lecture, we were talking about jointly distributed Gaussian variables, random variables. And that was a special topic that we are going to emphasize a bit in this particular class because it appears a lot in the in the autonomous control community. Jointly or jointly normal random vectors. And if you remember, we uh, in the previous lecture I had this expression. So x is a function from omega to r m, y is a function from omega to r n minus m, x y is a function from omega to r n, and the distribution PDF is 1 over square root of 2 pi raised to n determinant of sigma x minus mu x y minus mu y transpose sigma inverse x minus mu x y minus mu y that's the PDF. This is the probability density function. And if I this is what my mu looks like and sigma is sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma yx sigma y y and this is a positive definite matrix in R n cross n space. So this is what we had I had mentioned in the previous class. This is what a jointly Gaussian or jointly normal random variables look like. Uh, their mean is a vector mu x mu y. Their covariance is uh, sig the, the covariance of x, the covariance of x comma y, covariance of y comma x, covariance of y comma y. One thing that I want to mention is the following. x comma y is expected value of x minus mu x, y minus mu y transpose. And if you look at covariance of y comma x, so this is my sigma x y, this is my sigma y x. Okay, so jointly Gaussian random variables are extremely important in statistics and probability and in particular in feedback control systems. Um, many noises 
are modeled as Gaussian random variables. And so in today's class, it will be clear why Gaussian random variables are so widespread, uh, like widespread in the controls community or in the autonomous systems community. So, so we have, we have the joint distribution, we need to figure out what the marginal distribution looks like, and we need to figure out what the, so there is joint, marginal, and conditional, right? So those are the three things we need to worry about. So this is the joint distribution of two random variables that are jointly Gaussian random variables. Now if you, if you look at these expressions carefully, this is what the covariance looks like. What do you think is the relationship between sigma xy and sigma yx? So if you look at what's inside the expectation, this is a vector, vector transpose. And in this case, it's y minus mu y, so this vector times x minus mu x transpose, so that vector, right? And it's a matrix, these two are matrices. So what do you think is the relationship between these two matrices? Transpose, okay? So the one matrix is transpose of another, which is why this is a symmetric matrix and it just so turns out that this is also a positive definite matrix. If it is not positive definite, it means that there is some correlation among the random, like a linear relationship among the ran random variables, so you want to get rid of those random variables that are linearly dependent on other random variables. <clears throat> Okay. So this is a joint. Now we need to worry about what the marginal distribution is. Okay. So I have jointly Gaussian random variable. If you look at the marginal on X, it's also a, there is also a PDF, probability density function associated with the marginal on X. And it turns out that the random variable X itself is a Gaussian distributed random variable. And this is given by 2 pi raised to m determinant of sigma xx exponential minus half x minus mu x transpose sigma xx inverse x minus mu x. Oh, there should be a. Okay, so x itself is a Gaussian random variable with a density function that's actually very similar to this. So you just remove all the y components from the distribution. You get the distribution of x, the marginal on x. Same thing happens for y. two pi raised to n minus m, determinant of sigma y y, exponential minus half y minus mu y transpose So that's what the distribution looks like, the joint distribution, sorry, the marginal distributions look like. <coughs> How do you arrive at these expressions? How do you get the marginal distribution? Well, you use that integral formula that I had mentioned in one of the previous classes. Of course, uh, taking an integral of such a horrible looking expression is a nightmare. So I don't expect you to do it at home. And that's why I've written what the final expression looks like. 
But the way to get that expression is actually integrating this with respect to y. You get the density on x. Integrate this with respect to x. You get the density on y. Okay, you get exactly this expression. How you compute, how you evaluate that integral is probably going to take pages of uh, material to be able to evaluate that integral that I just mentioned. So we are not going to evaluate the integral in the class. Now the next question is, we have the joint distribution, we have the marginal distribution, now we need to figure out what the conditional distribution looks like. Okay, so let's talk about conditional distribution. Okay. Now this is where things become very interesting. So the conditional distribution f of x given y would be f of x y over f y of y. Again, the numerator is a horrible expression, denominator is a horrible expression. So you can imagine that taking their ratio is also a complicated procedure. But here is the insight. Anyone knows what the insight here is? What is the insight about this joint, sorry, this uh, conditional PDF? No? Well, here is the insight. When two random variables are jointly Gaussian, then the conditional distribution is also Gaussian. Okay, so x, y, jointly Gaussian implies x given y is Gaussian, y given x is Gaussian. The reason number one, why Gaussian distribution is so important or is so widely used. Once you make the assumption that the random variables you are seeing has some sort of Gaussian distribution, all the conditional distributions are by default Gaussian distribution, uh, uh, have Gaussian distribution. Now, if you know that a random variable is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution, what do you, how do you characterize the distribution? Only two things, you need only two things to get the PDF. The first thing, you want to know what the mean is. Second thing, you want to know what the covariance matrix is. Once you know the mean and once you know the covariance matrix, your job is done. The PDF will have a form that looks like this. So, so that's the reason number one why Gaussian distribution is so widespread, so widely used is because just by making the assumption everything else becomes Gaussian and your computation becomes so much easier. So let's try and understand what the conditional distribution x given y looks like or, and then we will talk about what y given x looks like. So let's consider so what I want to come up with is the mean of x given y. And here is the expression for that. What's the expected value of x given y is equal to small y? So this capital Y is the random variable, small y is the realization. 
this is the random variable this is capital X so this is the expected value after doing the computation is given by mu x sigma x y sigma y y inverse y minus mu y so this y appears here in the expression the covariance of x given y and x given y is given by sigma xx minus sigma xy sigma yy inverse sigma yx I want you to observe some things and tell me what do you observe in these two expressions? So I have x and y jointly Gaussian, x given y is Gaussian, y given x is Gaussian. I have computed the expected value of x given a realization y and I have computed the covariance of x given y. What are the salient features that you notice in these two expressions? Anything that you want to mention? What type of feature you are Excuse me? Uh, what type of feature you are expecting? Okay, so let me start with one specific feature that I'm seeing is that the mean depends linearly on y. Okay? So here is the y, and if I look at the expression for the mean, it depends linearly on y. It's a matrix multiplied by y plus something else. So if I mu of x given y is some matrix, let me call it m y plus some vector v. It's linear in y, okay? The mean of x given y is a matrix multiplied by y plus some vector v. So that's one feature that I observed. That's the first thing I observed. Anything else that you observe in these expressions? What about this expression? Does it depend on y? the realization of y? No, it does not. Okay, so the covariance x given y, x given y does not depend on y. It depends on the distribution of y because you see sigma yy, sigma xy, all of these terms appearing here. But actually, it doesn't really depend on the actual realization of y. So if x is the true temperature and y is the temperature measured through the thermostat uh, temperature sensor and if assuming that they are Gaussian, distribu Gaussian distributed, the mean 
of the temperature given my observation depends on the observation, but the covariance does not depend on the observation. Okay. Anything else that you notice, which is actually the most important, I mean not the most important, I mean all these three things are important, but there is a third thing that we also notice in these expressions. So remember sigma xx is a positive definite matrix, sigma yy is a positive definite matrix, and sigma xy times sigma yy inverse times sigma yx. This is a positive semi-definite or a positive definite matrix uh, depending on, depending on uh, the dimensionality of x and y. Okay. So I observed this and I observe a negative sign here. So I'm subtracting a positive semi-definite matrix from a positive definite matrix. What does that mean? So my uncertainty about a random variable is dependent on the covariance of that random variable. If the covariance is very large, then I know that the spread of the random variable is very large. If the covariance is very small, then I know that the random variable is uh, is close to the mean, okay, with very high probability. What you are observing here is that there is a reduction in uncertainty about the value of x, okay, and the reduction in uncertainty depends on the joint covariance matrix. So because, because you are subtracting a positive semi-definite matrix from a positive definite matrix, the eigenvalues of these matrices is going to become smaller. And when the eigenvalues are becoming smaller, it means that there is a reduction in uncertainty. There is a reduction in uncertainty about x. And that's because the variance, the covariance of x given y is actually smaller than the covariance of x. It's smaller than the covariance of x. So if I don't observe the temperature right now in the thermostat, I guess the temperature could be anywhere between 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever that may be, like whatever that range may be. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty. I don't know what the temperature, can someone tell me what the temperature of this room is? You know, like all of us have thermostats, all of us have lived in houses with thermostats. We kind of know the feel, right? What do you think is the temperature? I mean, you can, we can just have an audience poll and we can talk about what the real temperature of this room is without observing Y. So Y is the thermostat temperature. Y is what I can observe. I can go there and I can look up what the temperature is. But I don't know why. I haven't looked at why. And I want to know what the temperature of the room feels like. What do you think? So 70. 70, okay. I'm getting number 70. Any, anything else? 72. 72. What else? 71. 71, okay. Anything else? Okay, so it seems like everyone agrees that the temperature of the room is somewhere around this number. So there is a spread uh, that I see. Spread is of the order of 2 degrees Fahrenheit, okay. Now let's, let me go and check what the realization Y is at this moment, okay? All right, so it's 69.9. Okay, who, who said 70? Okay, okay, so 69.9. That's the temperature of this room at the moment. That is equal to Y. That is equal to Y. Now knowing why, knowing that the temperature sensor is saying that the temperature of the room is 69.9, what do you think, knowing this value, how do you change your observation? This was your possible x in the beginning. Now that I have known y, what do you think x would belong to? What kind of set x would belong to? 
somewhere around 69.9. So I guess it will be now 69.8, 69.9, and maybe 70. Okay, so the knowledge of Y has reduced the uncertainty in the X, which is the unknown thing, like something that we cannot really, uh, I don't know what the true temperature of the room is, but I know what the thermostat reading says, what the temperature of the room is. And so the true temperature of the room is likely in this particular range, because we know that this is a very accurate measurement of the room temperature. So this is your, this is your sigma xx, like whatever the covariance of this spread looks like. And this is your covariance of x given y, x given y is. Does that make sense? There is a reduction in uncertainty by observing y. And I can, uh, I can see this ob directly just by observing this expression that initially I had a spread of about 2 degrees Fahrenheit, but after observing the temperature I have a spread of around 0 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. There is a reduction in uncertainty about what the true temperature of the room is. And that's what I meant by the third point, third bullet point. So the first and second actually helps us in the mathematical computation, like when you are writing algorithms in, in an embedded device. Let's say you are running Kalman filter or something, which we will talk about in, in, in the future. These things help us do the matrix computation and write our codes about what we think based on all the information we have received. What do I think is the true state of the world? So I have four wheel rotation sensors. I have the information from them. I kind of know what the, what the tire pressure is, and I know what the radius of the tire is under different tire pressures. So based on all that information, I can kind of compute what the velocity, average velocity, or expected value of the velocity is based on the four tire rotation sensor readings that I have. And the prior knowledge about the radius of the tire, tire pressure, and some of those variables. So I can do that computation, right? So that's why it's, it's important, these things are important, but this is important to just understand the fact that having more knowledge about the system reduces the uncertainty about the variable that we care about. So in the case of driving, I care about the velocity, but I can't really measure the velocity directly. I can only measure the velocity through tire sensors, so tire rotation sensors, and so, I have some way to compute that velocity, okay? And this happens everywhere. There is a true state, there is a true temperature of the room. I can only observe the thermostat temperature and try and guess what the true state of the room looks like. I could maybe get a very accurate sensor, temperature sensor, um, and I can put it in the room and it will exactly tell me up to 10 decimal digits what the temperature of the room looks like, right? And then I have this thermostat which is giving me an approximate value of the temperature. So, so that's the, that reduces the uncertainty I have about X, about the temperature of the room. So I talked about tire rotation, I talked about the room temperature. What other examples can we think of where this sort of phenomena appears? Anyone else has some example where you don't really measure the truth. I mean, you, you cannot know the true thing, but you measure it through some sensor and you get an idea about what the true thing is probably, what does that look like? Any other example you could think of? I'm sure there are pressure sensors somewhere in the building. I don't know in what, oh, well. Well, pressure sensors are used in air conditioning system to understand what the pressure of the uh, refrigerant is, okay? so. In those cases, again, you have a sensor, you have a true pressure, you have a sensor, and the sensor reduces the uncertainty in the pressure that you have in the refrigerant. What else? There's pressure sensor, temperature sensor, I don't know, light sensor. 
Uh, I don't quite know why light sensors would be used, but anyways. So it, this happens again and again in many autonomous systems. You are measuring something using sensors and having knowledge from sensors reduces the uncertainty that you have in the original uh, system. Okay. So that was uh, conditional distribution. Now let me write the same expression for y given x just to complete the so you have both the expressions with you even though you can easily compute it so expected value of y given x is equal to x would be mu y sigma y x sigma x x inverse x minus mu x and then covariance y given x y given x would be sigma y y y x sigma x x inverse sigma x y so that's just the relationship in the other way so x given y is Gaussian, y given x is Gaussian. I know what the mean looks like, I know what the covariance looks like for the conditional distribution. Now I can find the PDF by plugging it into the uh, expression for Gaussian distribution. Any questions so far on this joint? Con joint marginal and conditional distribution for Gaussian random variables. Any question? This is for uh, f y given x. f y given x. So yes. That's right. That's right. This is for f y given x. This is for f x given y. Okay. Now let's uh, talk about the handout that I have given you. I'm going to upload it on Carmen so you will have it with you later on. So I want to study a very specific class of correlation between x and y. So my x is, let's say, the true state. And my y is ax, ax plus b. So here b is a Gaussian distribution with sigma bb, let me call it bb. A is a matrix that is well known. A is a matrix in R M R N minus M cross M. This is known. X is a Gaussian random variable with mean mu X and covariance sigma xx and x and b are independent x and b are independent so x is Readings from 
tire rotation sensors and y is the velocity of vehicle okay and because different tires have different pressure they could have different radius uh, because of the pressure and because of the loading of the vehicle. So different tires have different pressure, different uh, radius and so on, uh, different friction coefficients and all that. So of course the uh, readings from the tire rotation sensors are going to be different and the noise which is what the pressure in the tire is, what the radius of the tire is and all that stuff. So that's independent. We are just going to make the assumption that that's independent of the actual reading that you're getting from the tire rotation sensors. Okay, so B would be pressure of the tire, radius of the tire, slip. So if you're, if you're driving in the, on a muddy road or on a, on a road with uh, some slippery item like some oil or something and then some of the tires will slip okay they will rotate at a much faster speed than rest of the tires so you could have all those other disturbances which would affect the velocity reading of your vehicle so i'm going to just assume that these disturbances the pressure radius and slip these are independent of the readings from the tire rotation sensors i'm just going to make that assumption so that my life is easier Many a times in uh, autonomous systems, you would make assumptions of independence even though you might think that there is dependence between them. You will make the assumption that they are independent just to make your life simpler and be able to solve the problem. On the other hand, if you make the assumption that they are correlated, now you have to figure out what kind of correlation they have and it just creates a lot of problems for, doing the, for coming up with the strategy control strategy. So we'll not, we'll just make the assumption that they are independent, just to make our life easy and get the work done. So now, because X is Gaussian, AX is Gaussian, B is Gaussian, so AX plus B is Gaussian, because this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian, so Y is Gaussian. And y and x become jointly Gaussian random variable because x is Gaussian, y is Gaussian, and they differ from each other by a Gaussian random variable and a matrix rotation. So it's a Gaussian random it's a jointly Gaussian random variable, x and y. And now I want to characterize that given x, uh, no, x is the true state, sorry. So, oh, sorry, I, I should have written it the other way. So, the readings from tire rotation sensor is Y, which is what I observe, and the true velocity of the vehicle is X. So, that's the true state. That's what I'm, I'm worried about. That's what I want to know. I don't care about the readings from tire rotation sensors. All I want to know is what the velocity of the vehicle is. That's the true state that I'm interested in. Okay. Okay, good. So X and Y are jointly Gaussian. And now, my goal is to compute the distribution I want f of x given y. So y is what I have observed. I want to know what the distribution of x looks like. What do I need to do? I, I know that x and y are jointly Gaussian. I want to find out what this PDF looks like. What should I care about? Well, I care about expected value of x given this and covariance of x given y and x given y. Those are the two things I care about. That's it.
Now you know how to compute this. If I could give you the value of mu x, mu y, and if I can give you sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma yx, sigma yy. Does that make sense? These are the six things, six mu x, mu y, well, not six actually, only four, because mu x and sigma xx is known. So these two things are known. I need to tell you what this looks like, what this looks like, and what this looks like. Okay? Now, of course, this is transpose of this, so I only need to tell you what this is, what mu y is, and what sigma y y is. And once I tell you these three quantities, you can go back to the expressions I had written in the previous, maybe like 10 minutes ago on the blackboard. You can just use them to evaluate this value and this value, right? So let's uh, talk about each of them individually. Of course, I have given you this handout which contains all the expressions. So instead of noting it down while I'm doing the calculation, I would prefer that you just look at the blackboard and try to follow the discussion. Okay. So I have to compute mu y, sigma x y, and sigma y y. These are the three things I need to tell you. So let's try to compute them. What is expected value of y? Okay, so y equals to ax plus b. What is expected value of y? So that would be expected value of ax plus b, which is a times expected value of x plus expected value of b, which is equal to a times mu x. Okay, so let me write that down here. So mu y is a mu x. Now I need to compute sigma x, y, okay? So let's do the computation. This is expected value of x minus mu x, y minus mu y transpose. Okay, now this looks like a horrible expression, right? Let's try to see if we can Simplify it. So this is expected value of x y transpose minus mu x expected value of y transpose minus expected value of x mu y transpose plus mu x mu y transpose. So I just uh, multiplied all these terms individually. So I have x y transpose minus mu x y transpose, uh, x minus mu y transpose, and then minus mu x minus mu y transpose. So there are two negative signs. So that makes it a positive number here. Uh, I mean positive sign there. Now this is mu y transpose. This is mu x transpose. So actually, what I'm observing is one of these, these terms cancel each other out. Because expected value of y transpose is mu y transpose. Sorry, I, I think I messed up. So it has to cancel with one of those terms. So let me, let me, so this is with negative sign, this is with positive sign, so I can erase that. 
And so I only left with E x y transpose minus mu x mu y transpose. I guess the first and the third term. Sorry? So sorry, the second term and fourth term should cancel each other. Well, this will, oh sorry, this is mu x. This is not mu x transpose. This is the expected value of x, so this is mu x. So this is mu x mu y transpose, this is mu x mu y transpose. Okay, so they cancel each other out. So I only have to evaluate expected value of x, y transpose, and then I have to subtract mu x, mu y transpose from that. So where should I do it? Let me do it here on this side. What is expected value of x, y transpose? This is expected value of x, a x plus b transpose. So this is expected value of x, x transpose, a transpose, plus expected value of x, b transpose. Now x and b are independent, so this expectation can be written as expected value of x, expected value of b transpose, and I know that expected value of b is actually equal to zero by assumption so therefore, this term actually is equal to zero. Now I need to know what expected value of xx transpose, a transpose looks like. A transpose is a matrix, so I only have xx transpose times a transpose. Now I'm just going to write what expected value of xx transpose looks like. That is equal to sigma xx plus mu x mu x transpose a transpose. Okay, this is an identity in a probability uh, theory, not very difficult to uh, identify. So I have expected value of x, y transpose, and I have mu x times mu y transpose. Mu y transpose is mu x transpose a transpose. And so what you will notice after all the calculations are done and, and things settle down, this is actually sigma xx a transpose. This is the only term, sigma xx multiplied by a transpose, that's the only term that will survive. All the other terms will go to zero. Okay? Again, the derivation is there in the handout, so uh, you can go back and get the actual expressions from there and understand all these steps again. But this is what the train of thought is. So I have to compute sigma xy. I went through a bunch of expressions and inequalities. The key thing here was that there is a cancellation here of two terms. And there is a cancellation here because expected value of b is assumed to be zero because b has mean zero, right? We also use that fact here. This is equal to zero. So I've computed sigma xy. The only thing that I need to compute now is sigma yy. Okay, so let's, let's get to that. Let's compute sigma yy. Any question on this derivation so far before I erase it? Okay, so I have sigma yy is equal to y minus mu y 
y minus mu y transpose which is again equal to by the same derivation earlier y y transpose minus mu y mu y transpose this is expected value of ax plus b ax plus b transpose okay i need to uh, evaluate this expression so i have a x x transpose a plus b b x transpose a transpose sorry a transpose here plus a x b transpose plus b b transpose minus mu y mu y transpose okay i just expanded this matrix matrix transpose expression once again i see that there is an expected value of b x transpose term b and x are all they are independent random variables and expected value of b is equal to 0 so this term in expectation will be 0 this term in expectation will be 0 and i am only left with a x x transpose a transpose and b b transpose why the uh, b expectation of b was 0 we had make we had made that assumption b is a zero mean random variable oh. yeah if b was not zero mean random variable then of course you will have to carry that term around in the entire expression but i don't want to do it in the class <clears throat> now you have expected value of a x x transpose a transpose expected value of bb transpose this in expectation is actually sigma bb um and then this is of course you have to do the same same thing we did here and your sigma yy turns out to be a sigma xx a transpose plus sigma bb after doing all the calculation just like we did in this case that's what it will turn out to be No, because uh, this is the covariance of of B. So B is of course correlated with itself. It's not correlated with other random variables, right? Not other random variable. It's not correlated with X. Okay. So now I have mu y. I have sigma x y. I have sigma y y. I can plug it into the expression that I gave you, and I can compute what's the probability density function of x given y. Okay. Now, if you go back to the other side, it tells you what mu of x given y is. It has a horrible expression. and it tells you what is sigma x given y so covariance of x given y is the other thing you will notice if you go back to the page 2 equation number 7 there is a reduction in the uncertainty associated with x once y is given okay so you have a negative sign sigma x minus negative of some positive semi definite matrix Okay so that's all I wanted to cover today which is jointly gaussian random variable and then what happens when x and y has a linear relationship how do you compute the expected value of x given y and the covariance of x given y so we have completed our discussion on jointly gaussian random variables now in the next class I'm going to talk about uh, central limit theorem law of large numbers and hypothesis testing hypothesis testing is the major chunk of this class 
because all the cyber attack detection becomes a hypothesis testing problem. So we'll focus a lot on hypothesis testing in the subsequent weeks. Uh, based on all the stuff that I've talked about, um, uh, I'm going to upload the quiz today, quiz two, and it will be due after a week. So please keep an eye out for quiz two. Thank you for your attention. See you on Monday.